live. I'm going to um, get count you down to three, two, one, and then you'll be able to start. Okay. Okay. Three, Great. Two. Well, d uh, not me. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2.30 p.m. session in the Research and Education track. As a reminder to our in-world audience and our web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. Well, this hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Instructional Design in the Virtual Environments. Our speaker today is Catherine Donahue. Catherine is a graduate student at Drexel University in the Learning Technologies program with a concentration in instructional design. Her areas of interest are new media, universal design for learning, virtual world learning environments, and game-based learning. Welcome all, and let's begin the session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my perspective on instructional design in virtual environments is that of an end user who is really new to these spaces. I'm out there on the edges of the open source community looking in and still feeling very challenged by the steep learning curve, uh, but excited by the opportunity for deep learning in these spaces. There have been a number of presentations throughout the conference from educators who are building environments here and from developers. Um, but my interest in the virtual worlds is a little bit different. I'm looking at repurposing existing environments in the design process. From that perspective, for me, a virtual world is one of many tools in the instructional design toolbox. So how does a virtual environment become a learning tool? If I'm repurposing virtual worlds that have been designed for recreation or artistic expression, uh, the design thinking in the instructional uh, design process is to match the affordances and constraints in the existing environment to the learning goals and to the needs of the learners. The theories, models, and strategies used in instructional design depend on how we view learners. Older models of instructional design focused on content, uh, viewing the learner as an empty vessel, a consumer of the content. But instructional design is evolving along with the learning sciences towards learning strategies that view learners as active builders of their own knowledge. Here, the design opportunities for active um, learning also involve reflection. So I'm thinking about what are the learner's goals and what are the needs of the unique learners that need to be met in order to reach those goals, and what learning technologies are the best match, uh, and then to design out from there. I started in Drexel's program for learning technologies in the game-based uh, learning concentration. But I found that I was less interested in leveraging games for learning as I was in exploring content that was being shared within the game communities, much like my interest here um, in, in the community uh, that's behind these virtual worlds. Uh, my interest there was in modding screencasts that you see on YouTube of uh, narrated gameplay, the gamer blogs um, where gamers are supporting each other, um, and curating content and also posting um, machinima that's made inside games unrelated to the gameplay. Midway through the uh, learning technologies program, I switched over to instructional design. And my primary focus then became design thinking, uh, with games being one more tool in the toolbox. But all of those things that interested me in games came along with me. And those are the same kinds of things that I'm thinking about as I look at other technologies, uh, for example, virtual worlds. Here we see Portal 2, which is one of my 
favorite video games for many reasons. Um, I'm showing it here because Valve released um, a free modding software for educators um, so that students could recreate puzzles from the game or build their own puzzles. And we're looking at it here because it, it's an example of a learning technology that's being repurposed for teaching um, physics. Uh, what you see here is um, a website called Physics with Portals. A high school teacher uh, figured out that he could use the Puzzle 2, uh, I mean the Portal 2 Puzzle Maker, to create an actual physics lab, a simulation that really runs very, very accurately. And I'm looking at this because when we're talking about um, you know, running simulations, we're talking about the engine. And um, Valve's source engine is very powerful and um, can replicate real-world physics in ways that virtual world engines cannot. Um, so when I'm looking for a free user-friendly virtual space for building a physics lab, I'm probably going to turn first to Puzzle Maker. However, um, I was reading um, MIT's technology review site uh, back in June and saw that um, there, there was an article that, that addressed those issues, but talked about how virtual worlds give us an innovative environment to um, interact with physics precisely because um, the source engines don't work in the same way. Um, and this allows educators to simulate universes in which matter is governed in an entirely different way and allows students to study and experience laws of motion that are entirely different ones from those in our universe. So when this is the learning goal, a virtual world becomes a really good match for the study of physics. And again, I'm talking about repurposing environments, not building them. Um, because I've done some exploring and I've seen some wonderful science builds out there. But I'm coming from the perspective of someone who's not building, uh, someone who's repurposing. So if we think about the wide range of learner variability in the motivation to learn science, we can take this kind of thinking in a different direction. What you see here on the screen are screenshots uh, that I took on an island that was designed for people who have a passion for photography and want to play around with composition and light. Uh, this is a recreational space that I've really enjoyed and I have um, a lot of pictures. In fact, I should be putting them on Flickr. Um, I remember when I taught middle school physical science not many of my students were engaged by these kinds of diagrams that we find in textbooks and even on the web. So in thinking about repurposing environments in this context, I'm thinking about the emotional impact of sunrises and sunsets in virtual worlds and using those subjective experiences as a point of entry for students who aren't really engaged in learning science directly. Uh, the screenshot here is from OpenSim because I'm thinking also about students who have an interest in the technology um, in virtual worlds. Many of the presentations this weekend talked about students doing the building, which is so exciting. So a student who has that technology interest might be able to come to this content um, in thinking about how light interacts in the virtual space in contrast to real world science and might be thinking about scripting to change how light behaves in any environment um, or building environments um, like those that are designed for photography. Other students might be more motivated to experience the aesthetics of a simulated sunrise, midday, sunset, and reflect on those subjective experiences, using those kinds of experience as a bridge to the science behind the experience. 
and an added benefit here is opportunity for social learning, where students can travel to these spaces together, um, you play with the, uh, the settings for time of day, take lots of um, you know, uh, screenshots, and then come back and um, reflect on those experiences and the science behind it. So in the end, all of these students, um, whether playing with um, physics laws that don't apply to our world, or thinking about the technology behind virtual worlds, and doing their, their own um, scripting and designing in world, or students who just want to experience sunset and come to the science through that lens, everyone is getting to the same learning goal. They're just getting there in different ways. And what I love about virtual worlds is how easy it is to um, think about this variability and give children um, a freedom um, to explore in these ways. This um, journal article is a wonderful example of this kind of complex design in higher education. Elizabeth Zold designed an active learning project that allowed for autonomy in experiencing her course content in a way that supported unique learner reflections and gave them an opportunity for much deeper learning than they would have experienced just with text. Um, in this project, her students were studying 18th century travel logs and studying the genre. And then they traveled throughout the virtual world. Um, I believe in her article it was Second Life where they traveled, uh, but this could actually be happening um, on any grid. And they were traveling primarily to experience new cultures. So you have the culture of the island that they're exploring. You have um, the, the culture of the community that then comes and, and gathers in that place. And the, the community of virtual worlds themselves. So here, pre-built environments are repurposed, uh, re repurposed for exploration, um, not just for the geography, um, but for the culture, which was the purpose of studying these travel logs uh, from the 18th century. This study really interested me because it, it really leverages the whole idea of the ecologies of learning and the complexity of learning that can happen in these spaces. So when I go back to the toolbox and I think about selecting environments for learning, sometimes the real world is the environment where the learning needs to occur. For example, if students are going to grow an organic garden, um, it's about growing food. And so I would want my students to have real food that can be eaten um, because it, it's about the larger community um, where they may take the food home or donate it in the local community um, or sell it to benefit the school community. And I think there are wonderful simulations that go with this where students can learn more about plants and how they're growing. In fact, there are some game environments I um, know of that do that. But in this case, you want an actual environment. And sometimes it's modding a game environment because of the technology, because of the engine, because of the drag and drop, because it's just easier. But other times, it's about designing in very complex, social, collaborative environments where we can really explore and um, reflect in a very collaborative and a very social way. So here we're back in the game world again, but I I don't have um, Game Store Mechanic up here to, to talk about games, even though it's a brilliant game and um, it's an, an amazing um, 
piece of software to teach game design. Um, I, I'm looking at Game Star Mechanic to talk about reflection on learning and how that is also part of instructional design. Here what we see is an example of how this game is designed so that after a student designs a game, a classmate can play the game and they can put their feedback not only right in the game, but also right at the point in the game where they're targeting their feedback. For example, um, if, if this, this, the classmate thinks that the design needs to be tweaked or that something doesn't work or that something is missing, you see those little arrows. They, they can put the message right there so that when the designer of the game goes back in and they're receiving their feedback, they're receiving it in action in that environment. And I talk about that here because I think that screen capture, whether it's um, a still photo or whether we're looking at uh, capturing for video, uh, is a wonderful affordance that we hear, have here in learning environments. So many of the presentations this weekend talked about role play um, or all kinds of building or things that you don't necessarily have an artifact later for reflection and sharing on the learning. So I've been thinking about that as I've explored virtual worlds. Here you see back in the spring, I was preparing to go to a conference um, in Second Life and OS Grid that was similar to, to the conference um, where we are this weekend. And before I went, because I was totally new to virtual worlds at this point, I practiced sitting, walking, teleporting, and I, I don't know why, but I, I captured it with Camtasia. And I was so glad that I did because it gave me an opportunity to go back and reflect on the learning. Now, here, for, for me, the content was not learning other content in the virtual world. For me, the content here was learning the virtual world, learning how to interact um, in that world. And I've taken these videos and edited them to find the, the places where I have insights and then shared them with, um, you know, back at Drexel in, in my classes with people who aren't using virtual worlds. And they've been so well received because they're not only learning about my experiences, but they're also learning about my own learning curve and, and my insights as I go. So I think that that leveraging this tool is a wonderful opportunity um, for students to be able to um, reflect on problem solving and learning in these spaces. Um, here we have an example from when I finally got to the conference. Um, despite all my practicing, there were so many things that I still did not know how to do. Uh, you see me sitting there on the left, I have the red jacket on. And I can't hear the speaker because I don't know how to go into the viewer um, and, you know, move the viewer's conversation closer to myself. I don't know how to zoom in on the screen. Um, but I'm resourceful, so I picked up the live feed. And I, I didn't want to just watch the live feed because I had worked so hard and practiced to go into that environment and be part um, of the conference. So I wound up doing both, uh, being there to get that that feeling of presence and watching it on the live screen so that I could uh, get the content. Here you see I've started to play around with that video. Um, I uploaded some of it to a site called Wirewax. And uh, that's a cloud uh, technology. It's like a studio where you can upload your video and then you can tag it. Um, for interactive viewing. I was playing around with this uh, to create a training video for um, others who are not familiar with virtual worlds who might want to come in and experiment and explore. And the thing I like about the interactive piece is that the variability again, that, that student, well, that, that whoever watches this can uh, choose to only click on the pieces that interest them or pertain to them. And so I 
think that this could be a wonderful tool for preparing students for learning that's been designed for the virtual environment, for students themselves to use to capture their learning there, um, not just editing the insights or their, you know, their, their own insights on their learning process um, and maybe narrating them, but also possibly making them interactive. And what I really love about that and the reason that I'm using Wirewax is that the analytics there are free. As I said, there are a number of online um, cloud technologies that will do this, but this one has free analytics, which I think is great, um, not only for instructors to see what students are clicking on, but also for students if they use this for their own learning and their own presentations so that they can see um, what other students are clicking on when they're watching you know their presentations and their feedback also thinking that when you're recording group interactions and group projects it could be really fun to have students um, each narrate their own and and see how different um, it all comes out and you know maybe interactivity can be built in there um, so that you could click to different insights and reflections on that learning. So I'm going to try pasting a URL in. Um, I had a third reflection that I did at the conference. Um, this is my last day as an attendee at the conference. And I'm so excited in this video because I have finally figured out how to navigate my environment. So I'm not seeing that come up, so I'm typing it into live chat. Uh, the, the video is about a minute and a half, so I'm just going to wait a few minutes um, for those of you who'd like to click on it and view the video. Four days later, I'm at the last session. I've learned to zoom in. I can see. So that brings us to the end of the slides that I had prepared today. Um, so I'm going to stop here and take questions. Um, if, if you um, see up on the, the slide, I've added my uh, Twitter handle. I'm going to um, 
type that into local chat now. I um, am working on a website with these videos, and it's not up yet. So if you would like to follow me on Twitter when I have those videos posted, um, I would love for people to come and see them and, and give feedback. So that's all I have for today. So thank you. Did you want to uh, ask about some questions uh, since we have some time, Catherine? Sure. Are, are there any questions about any of uh, the things that I've talked about here today, either the, uh, the websites or the technologies or um, some of the studies? I hear a little typing. Maybe uh, we have a question coming, it sounds like. Okay, question from Stephen. Uh, do your students carry their reflections and digital recordings after the class is over? Like on their personal websites or social media? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm working with students at, at this point who would be higher education, but whether I was doing this in higher ed or K-12, um, my personal feelings behind this, whether it's analytics or uh, video and editing, is that I want students uh, making the choices and owning the, contact, uh, owning the content. So um, I'm not wanting to have that be the instructor's video. I'm wanting that to be the student's video. Uh, I see a question about wire wax, and I have a link for that. Um, there's, um, there's the link for wire wax. It's um, free to register. To register. And there are tutorials on the site for, for um, not, only not only creating, creating uh, uh, the tags, tags uh, but, also but also for the analytics. The analytics. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, and let's see if we have any final questions at this point. Uh, let's take a look real quick in local chat. All right, you gave us the uh, link for Warrior Wax. That's cool. Um, and everybody saw that if you need to reach out and contact uh, Catherine, you can reach her on Twitter at um, K-A-T-H-M-R-E. So thank you very much, Catherine. That was an awesome presentation today. Um, this session closes out the business track uh, presentations, and we are at the end of the second annual Open Simulator Community Conference. A tremendous thank you to all of our speakers, our sponsors, crowdfunders, volunteers, and hundreds of attendees who braved a host of technical challenges to make this conference a great success. Following the conference program, all um, staff and volunteers are invited to the stage at the Keynote 1 region for pictures as well as a celebration, and the audience is welcome to join the festivities on your assigned Keynote regions. In addition, there are um, still three social events after the conference to keep the excitement going. At 3.30 p.m. Pacific, uh, Stephen Zootfly will be hosting an Educators Birds of a Feather meeting on the Avacon grid uh, to discuss how to encourage more educators to use Open Simulator. Great. Then at 5 p.m. Pacific, Lucina Wyndham Seeker hosts a continuation of the Quest for the Galaxy Language session on the Second Life grid in the Inspiration Island region. And finally, the last social event of the conference is at 7 p.m. Pacific on the Pirates Atoll grid. 
um, dance on on the Sunset Beach at Pirates Atoll to the ethereal sounds of dream pop and the indie beat. A great time to unwind and socialize after the conference. A tremendous thank you to uh, all of our speakers, sponsors, crowdfunders, volunteers, and again, the hundreds of attendees who braved a host of challenges to come to this conference and make it a great success. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you next year at the Open Simulator Community Conference 2015.